Hi there, and after the summer's hiatus, we're back. I'm your host, John Iverson, and today we're going to discuss the implications of the Prime Minister's dramatic statement in the House of Commons on Monday. I'm joined by Karthik Nachiapan, who is a senior fellow with the Macdonald Laurie Institute and a research fellow at the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. Karthik, welcome. Thank you, John. So the statement I'm referring to, of course, is Justin Trudeau's allegation that Canada has credible evidence that the Indian government was involved in the murder of Sikh activist Hardeep Singh Nijjar last June. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, do you think the, Indian, the Canadian government has handled it as delicately as it might have done, or perhaps as it should have done? Well, I, I think this is a very difficult circumstance. Um, the, the issues are very sensitive for both Canadian and Indian officials. Uh, we still don't know a lot of the information that the government has um, and the kind of evidence that they're using to justify the claims that the Prime Minister has made in Parliament. Um, my guess is that the government has enough evidence um, to come out and make a somewhat authoritative statement in Parliament um, regarding Indian actions in this particular circumstance. Um, now, the Prime Minister's statement was also very carefully worded. Um, not, not just in terms of what he said, but also what he didn't say. Um, he mentioned credible accusations um, and of links to potential involvement of the Indian government in this extrajudicial killing, which, which means that the gov government has um, some evidence and has connected some of the dots that does exist in that points to some Indian involvement in this particular murder. We still don't know whether it was state sanctioned. We still don't know whether it was rogue elements of the Indian government. Um, we still don't know um, whether it was any other elements tied to uh, the Indian intelligence or anybody linked to the Indian government. Um, so there, there is a lot of um, things, information that we don't know. Um, and my guess is that the government and the prime minister cannot reveal that at this particular stage unless until they go out and uh, do more, more work on this. Now, part of the problem now is that the government has had to come out and um, openly, um, and the prime minister has had to come out and openly uh, declare that there was alleged Indian involvement here because the Globe and Mail got wind of this particular story and they were gonna go out and publish their own report on this particular um, incident. And I think the government was also driven by domestic political circumstances that they had to get not just ahead of what the globe was trying to say, but also the potential opposition that would have emerged. Uh, should the government have, you know, well, if they had been a little bit reticent or slow in this particular instance, um, as was the case in uh, what happened with respect to the China issue and, and you know, when we're talking about all the foreign interference stuff over the summer, so there was a so there's a lot of different things at play. There's the domestic politics tied to the opposition and how much they can um, they can accuse the government of being slow in terms of foreign interference, as they were with China. Um, there was the issue that this was a very potentially a very very serious issue of an extrajudicial killing undertaken by another country on Canadian soil which to my knowledge has not happened before. Um, so, Ted, and the fact that we still don't know a lot of, of, of what's happened, not just in terms of the particular murder, but also the investigation that's happened. So the government has, is, I think, trying to hedge its bets, trying to come up and state that there is some Indian involvement here without going any further, because they still need the Indians to cooperate in this particular case. I was just going to say, the Indian government has denied any involvement, um, you know, claiming it's a democratic country that abides by the rule of law. Is that credible? Well, I, I mean, again, we don't know a lot, a lot of the information that's out there, what kind of information the government has, what kind of information CSIS has, whether there is um, any kind of, um, uh, whether it's phone records or whether it's financial records that ties 
elements of the Indian government to this particular killing. Um, it, it all depends on the evidence that the Canadian security agencies have, right? Um, and I think that right now at this stage, we don't know. We know that there's some evidence that the government claims is enough to to come out in parliament and make this case. But, but more than that, we, we still don't know. And, and that's what the opposition leader came out and said today is, we need more information of what what's happening, what the, what the prime minister said, what the government is claiming. And my guess is we're not going to get that anytime soon because we still have an investigation underway. We need the Indians to cooperate with us. Uh, and, 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 and so because of all these reasons, we, we don't know what's happening. Now, clearly, it, the, the assassination of a Canadian citizen on Canadian soil is, as Justin Trudeau said, a, a violation of Canada's sovereignty. Um, but other countries like the US have assassinated their enemies, Osama bin Laden, for one, on the grounds that it was an act, a, an act of national self-defence. The Indians believe Nijar was a terrorist who organised training camps in Canada. It claims that Canada gave space and shelter to Khalistani terror groups. Do you think those claims have any credence? And if if they do, is, is India any worse than the US was, uh, or, or Israel is when it assassinates Iranian nuclear physicists? Now that's a tough one. I think these are very um, different circumstances and we need to take them individually. Um, I, I think in this particular case, um, we do know that Niger has been involved in a range of different activities against the Indian government, right? So he's been involved in, I, I mean, based on what I've read and heard, he's been calling for a referendum, um, an international referendum for a Khalistani state in India. Um, he's been increasingly clamoring um, for um, more justice against Sikhs in India. Um, he's been trying to, and he's been part of the movement that's been working to foment violence against Indian diplomats uh, in Canada. And there were posters all over the summer, uh, some of which has been tied to his involvement and involvement of groups that he supports. Um, so, so there's a lot here that elements uh, close to Niger and Niger himself have been um, accused of doing. Whether that's sufficient to um, eliminate him, um, I don't think so, right? I think what the Indians would claim is that they've been trying to get the Canadian government to take this more seriously, to take the issue of, of Sikh separatist elements in Canada more seriously, to um, remove or to, to, to remove the space that they have in undertaking activities that are not just anti-Indian, but also increasingly um, fomenting violence against Indian diplomats. So the Indians have always claimed that they are trying and they're pushing, they're, 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 they're doing everything they can to get Ottawa much more serious about this issue. And they've, I guess that's fallen on deaf ears. Whether that means that the Indians would then take matters into their own hands and through their own operatives undertake this particular act. Uh, that's a stretch which I think we right now don't have the evidence to make that particular assertion. But I, I don't think it's that simple. Do you, uh, do you think Canada could do more to, to clamp down on terror funding and activism in the, the Sikh community? And, and, a, and a corollary Question: uh, Do you think there's any justification in claims that the liberals have, in, the liberals in particular, have turned a blind eye to uh, extremist activities in return for electoral support? Well, I think this is not just a liberal. Uh, so, so this is not just an accusation that's levied against the liberals. I mean, for the last 15, 20 years, both parties that have been in power have been um, pandering to the. Um, Sikh diaspora, both in Ontario and British Columbia and other parts of Canada. Um, increasingly, they've become very, very important to um, majority governments, whether that whether whether it's a liberal majority or a conservative majority, they have the power to tip the scales in that respect. And so they've 
been much more open to um, their their ideas, their views, their their activities. I think what the Indian government has been particularly upset about is that there. I mean, and especially people. I mean, with, with Justin Trudeau, is that he's attended events that have clear Khalistani elements to them, and where Khalistan is glorified, and and where um, where support for Khalistan is ramped up. And, and I think that's the difference here, is that the liberals in particular have shown a disinterest not just in dealing with the issue of Sikh separatism in Canada, but they've showed up at different kinds of events that have glorified parts, um, aspects of Khalistan, which I, I think is difficult for any foreign government, especially one that's as sensitive as India, to stomach. Uh, and this is something that I think, so, and from what I hear in India, is that they've tried to get the Canadian government and Canadian officials to become more sensitive to that, um, because this is still a hot issue in India. Um, and especially over the last year, we've, we've seen Sikh separatism um, come back with full force. There are actors like Amrit Paul Singh who are, in a way, trying to revive what happened in 1984. Uh, and so over the last few years, this has become not, this is not just a theoretical issue for the government, but this is something that they're dealing with um, every day within the state of Punjab. And I think these concerns have, have been conveyed to Ottawa, but for various reasons, some electoral, I think some ideological, some political, um, this government has been unwilling to deal with it effectively and also willing to use the freedom of expression um, reasoning to justify everything that's happening. I think right. that's the other angle here, which requires some um, explanation. Right. I mean, I mean, you know, obviously, uh, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, but that that right ends. Uh, you know, your the right to swing your arm ends at my nose. So um, that does not seem to have registered. So I, I mean, I I take your point that a lot is is unclear. What I think is clear is that um, the Indo-Pacific strategy that the government uh, announced with much fanfare not so long ago is now in tatters. I mean, this was the idea that uh, Canada would pivot away from, from China and towards India as a, as a major geopolitical move. Um, do you agree that, that, that the future of that looks pretty dismal? Uh, it's bleak. Um, I think most countries that have an Indo-Pacific strategy emphasize both the Indo and the Pacific sides of the strategy. And emphasizing the Indo means developing a close and strategic relationship with India. And that is something that this government cannot do anymore in the future. Um, and because of that, that particular strategy as a whole is literally on life support. Um, there's the other angle is that the Indo-Pacific strategy also largely focuses on trade and investment, um, particularly with respect to India, looking at India as a major economy, as an economy that we need to to we need, we need to trade more with, we need to engage more. Um, but it doesn't really consider India as a strategic actor in the Indo-Pacific. It doesn't really try to expand security cooperation with India, or it doesn't um, look at how we can work with India on dealing with issues like maritime security, like climate change, like uh, digital technologies. All these issues are very, very important here in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and our strategy largely focuses on trade and investment. And focus on trade and investment, keeping India as the pillar of that particular um, focus. So I think on both respects, we are shorthanded and more, more so going forward because we are not going to have much of a relationship with India. I mean, that, that uh, relationship has long over-promised and under-delivered as long as I've been covering uh, kind of India relations, which is 20 years. Um, it's never really taken off. There was an attempt that uh, the trade minister was going to go to India in October. That's now cancelled. Uh, mm -hmm. It just does not look like uh, India is going to be a trade partner, far less an ally in the near future. Uh, I mean, what, what do you think could be done to 
to put the relationship back on track, if anything. Oh, I think what a lot of people are saying in, in India and, and my guess in Canada is right now is that we need a change of government in Canada um, to reset the relationship because I think there's too much ideological, political and personal baggage that Justin Trudeau and the Liberals bring, with, bring to and with this particular relationship that will just not make it work. So I think we're, we're being realistic here. Uh, a change of government will hopefully bring a, 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 a new approach, a new way of thinking about India in that part of the world. But that's the start. What needs to happen, even if a conservative government comes to power, is to establish political links and ties with this particular government. Um, because right now, all that is frayed. Uh, we need to come to grips on the issue of the, the Indian diaspora, particularly the Sikh diaspora, uh, and, and what role they play uh, in Canada and the effects of their activities in India, uh, and whether Ottawa is able to um, make a distinction between domestic activities and their foreign policy. Uh, this is something that's not happened for the last 15, 20 years. Uh, diaspora groups have had way too much say and sway on Canadian foreign policy, and I'm not just talking about India. Uh, going going forward, we need to really ring fence uh, strategic discussions, issues, and considerations from domestic politics, uh, and and that also needs to happen um, once a new government is in power. Do you think there's a role here for Stephen Harper? I mean, he he had particularly good relations with Modi. He, he went to India and Modi came to Canada in 2015. And there did seem to be a, a personal rapport, perhaps an ideological alignment. Um, I mean, I'm sure he's not keen to help the Trudeau government, but, but uh, this, is a, uh, this is the national interest at stake, surely. Yeah, and I don't think the Trudeau government is also keen to uh, no. seek his help on this particular issue. So <laughs> that's probably sure. not going to happen. Um, just, just finally, yeah. then, um, uh, this is just not not just a, a bilateral issue of Canada India. Yeah. Uh, it's potentially larger than that. It, it, the stories today that uh, that uh, the, the Canadian government had reached out to allies and urged them to speak out. Um, now, the, the Canadian government has denied that it did that. There's a story in the Washington Post. Uh, that it was rebuffed by the US and by the UK. But I'm sure it puts strain on both relationships. The, the, the British are trying to negotiate a trade deal with, with India, and they say that they don't want to mix up any of these issues. This is a real inconvenience for Biden and for Sunak in the UK, no? No, I, I, absolutely. I think um, they don't want to choose between India and Canada. I think the, the strategic concerns, the, the strategic considerations favour India far more than Canada. Uh, and that's largely because India is seen as a counterway to China. And increasingly countries in the West, US, UK, the, um, the European Union, uh, and also other allies like Japan, Australia, South Korea, increasingly see India as the only viable option to balance China, not just in Asia, but globally. Um, so strategically, all these countries have made a bet on India, except Canada. Uh, and they're hoping that Canada joins the party and does, uh, does so as well. But obviously that's not happened and that maybe is not going to happen anytime soon. Um, but if push comes to shove, these countries will, I think, given strategic considerations and concerns, pick, tilt closer to India and Canada. So, I mean... The bottom line then um, is, I mean, I, I know that the Canadian government has to express its outrage about the murder of a citizen on its soil, but it seems to me, given the geopolitical background you've just outlined, it was naive to do it in the way that Trudeau did it without offering evidence in the House of Commons, essentially using hearsay from the intelligence sources. Uh, do you think that uh, it could have been done more sensitively? Perhaps sending um, the foreign affairs minister out to make a statement and, and still kicking out an Indian diplomat? 
No, I think from the reporting that I've read that they did try to do that. They've sent national intelligence officials, they've sent a national security advisor to India, and they've sent other senior security officials. I think the CSIS director also went recently to India to talk to them about this. But I don't think any of them got anywhere um, with the Indians, um, understandably, um, which is when they are now working with allies, because I think that's the only leverage that Canada has to uh, compel India to do anything on this particular issue, um, is to try to get the Americans, the, the Brits, the Europeans, the French, to realize that this is not just a, a killing of a Canadian citizen, but this is a larger issue that has to do with foreign interference. Um, and I think that's why they're trying to internationalize it, which I think is not going to sit well with India and not going to sit well with all these countries that have made a strategic bet on India and invested deeply in India's rights. Well, great. Thank you very much for your time and your expertise. We much appreciate it. All the best. Thank you.